and the, the cells involved uh, uh, the, in the nonspecific immune system. All right, what, what we want to do now is talk about complement. Complement is, is a, as we said, was a humoral component of the nonspecific immune system, but it's one of the major ones, and, there, and it's got a lot of activities. Uh, and so we spend an, an, an essentially an hour time, maybe a little bit more, we'll see, uh, on complement. There we go. Complement was discovered by this guy. His name is Bourdais back in 19, 1894, and, and what, he, what he was looking for, he described a, a, the ability of, of serum to kill bacteria. So this was, this was a lytic activity, the ability of, of fresh serum to kill bacteria, and he called it complement. He also showed that, that complement was, was he, didn't, he didn't activate it. If you heated it a little bit, you destroyed that lytic activity, and he called this lytic activity complement. Uh, we know now that complement is actually a, a complex series of proteins. It's not a, just a protein or, or just a single thing. Com the the complement system is a, composed of a, over 30 different proteins that all play a role in the system. And so that's what we want to talk about. But here are some of the functions of, of complement. Many of the components of the complement system act as opsonins. Again, abstinence are things that enhance phagocytosis. Components of the uh, phagocytic or the complement system act as the attractants for phagocytes, and they also activate phagocytes. They lyse bacteria. That's how it was initially described. But they also, we won't talk too much about this, but they're involved in regulating antibody responses. They're involved in clearing immune complexes. When antigen antibody complexes form, they have to be cleared. The complement plays a role there. They're, they're involved in clearance of, of apoptotic cells. So there has a number of different, different activities. But as most things, there also can be some problems. A complement contributes to the inflammation process. And if, if, the, if it's not controlled, if we get too much activation of complement, it can result in anaphylaxis. So there, are, there can be some detrimental effects as well. Obviously, we'll concentrate primarily on the, the beneficial effects of complement. Now, just some stuff on nomenclature and, and some how, how busy housework and stuff that we need to take care of, and then we'll start talking about the system. As I said, there's a lot of different proteins in this system. Uh, they're given numbers. Most of the components are given numbers, so they're C1, uh, C2, all the way up through C9. C1 is actually composed of three different proteins, QRS, so you'll hear about C, uh, C1Q, C1R, C1S. That forms a complex, which is referred to as C1, or sometimes it's just referred to as C1QRS. Uh, so there are a series of proteins that have, are div designated with a C, followed by some number, in addition to those proteins, there are some, there is a series of factors. So they, they came up with other names for these are factors. So we'll have factor B, factor D, factor I, factor H. There's another one called factor P, which is preparedin. You'll see it either way. It'll be factor P or preparedin. So we have the complement, the main complement component. We have a number of different factors. There are Lectins involved. There's a mannose binding lectin, MBL, mannose binding lectin. And there are some mannose binding lectin associated serum proteins, protein, proteases, or MASPs, MASP1 and MASP2. These are all components of the, this complement system. Then there are various components that are act as inhibitors. So there, there's a C1 inhibitor. Obviously, this is an inhibitor of the C1 component of, of complement. So this is called C1INH. It's also, the other name for this is serpent. There's a C4 binding protein that's a component of the system. There's a decay accelerating factor, or DAF. There are complement receptors, uh, CR, complement receptor, and there's a number of different of them. Here we have complement receptor 1. There's a protein S, or vitronectin. All of these different proteins are all components of this system. These are... The, the most important ones, these uh, help regulate these components. Uh, this one here is, is actually a part of, of the, the system up here. These are all 
proteins that are involved in controlling the activity of complement. We have to control this activity because, again, if you don't control it, it can result in anaphylaxis. All right. So those are the proteins. Those are the components. A couple of terms of definition. When we talk, when we say complement activation, what we're meaning is an alteration of one of the components of complement in such a way that it reacts with the next component. This is very much like the comp, the the coagulation cascade that you've, you've had in biochemistry. This is a cascade of events. One thing happens, that leads to the next one, it, and it interacts with the next one, and so on. And you get an a amplification as you go through this system. So this is a, so complement activation is a change in one of the complement components that now allows it to react with the next component. Complement fixation, we all, you'll hear a lot about complement fixation tests and, and uh, in, in, during the rest of this course. Complement fixation refers to the utilization of complement by antigen antibody complexes. When you have an antigen, antigen antibody complex and complement is present, complement will be fixed and will be consumed. All right? And that is referred to as complement fixation, the utilization of complement by those complexes. The term that you're going to see in the in the labs when you when you if you ever order complement levels on your on your patients you're going to, they're going to come back with a unit called the, the hemolytic unit. Most commonly, it's a CH50 complement hemolytic unit 50. And what that is is what, what the lab is going to do is the lab is going to take your patient's serum, and they're going to make a series of dilutions of that serum. And then they're going to add to that serum some antibody-coated erythrocytes. And if, if there's antibody in, in the erythrocytes, that any, the antibody is bound to the erythrocytes, they will fix complement, resulting ultimately in the lysis of those erythrocytes. And what the lab is looking for is they're looking for what is the dilution of serum that gives me fit, lysis of 50% of my erythrocytes. And that is, is referred to as one complement fixing CH50 unit. So they'll look, so let's say they take a patient serum and they have to dilute it a hundred fold to get to the point where 50% of the erythrocytes are lysed. That is, in that hundred fold dilution, there is one hemolytic complement unit or one CH50. So how many are there in the un, undiluted sample? A hundred times that because you diluted it a hundred times. So they would report out to you that the complement titer is the CH50 for this individual is 100, right? It is refers to as a dilution of the serum that is required to give uh, ly lysis of 50% of a standardized suspension of antibody-coated erythrocytes, right? That's what a hemolytic eunuch it is. Okay. Complement inactivation is the denaturation of a component of complement. It's usually by heat, but it can be by other ways. Uh, resulting in the loss of hemolytic activity. So if you inactivate complement, in, as an initial thing that Bourdais did, he heated the serum, he inactivated the complement, and he lost hemolytic activity. Now this term, convertase, is used a lot in the complement field. And, and we'll, we'll talk about a, a C3 convertase and a C5 convertase. Convertase is, is just an altered, an altered form of the complement protein which acts as a proteolytic enzyme for another component. So a C3 convertase is a, is a complement component that will act on C3. A C5 convertase is a complement component that will react on with C5. These are all esterases, so you'll see it either, either referred to as an esterase or a convertase. Okay, when a component of complement is activated, by convention what we do is we overline the component. So for example, C1 with a line over it is, is, means that this component has been activated. If, it is, if, it is, if we saw just C1 QRS, that would be an inactivated component, or not inactivated, a, a non-activated component, okay? When it, once it becomes activated, then a, a overline is put over the thing. And this is true of all the different components. If you see an overline above it, that means that's an activated component, okay? Now, when, when, these, when many of these complement components get activated, they're actually proteolytically cut into, into two pieces, a big piece and a small piece. The larger component, the larger moiety, 
usually binds to the activation complex, all right? So if, if, the, if activation is occurring on a bacterial surface, it'll bind to the bacteria. If, if activation is occurring by an antigen antibody complex, it'll bind to the, the complex, all right? So the larger moiety typically is going to bind to that um, um, membrane component, all right? The smaller component is going to be released into the microenvironment. Right. That one actually is a, is a hardened faster. The, the larger component binds to the activation complex. The smaller component goes into the microenvironment. The, what, what gets confusing is the, the nomenclature. The letter, small b, is then added to the larger component. Okay? So for example, you, when, when C3 gets activated, you will get the production of C3b, small b, and C3a. This is the larger component and it binds then to the, mem to, to the activation complex. This is the smaller component which will be released into the, into the microenvironment. Same thing here, C4B. When C4 gets activated, it's cleaved into C4B and C4A. Same thing with C5. But as, as in all things, just to make it interesting for medical students, the, the powers that be said, but we'll make an exception, and then the exception is two. With complement component two, the larger moiety uh, binds to the membrane, but it's called C2A instead of C2B. All right. A couple of years ago, they actually tried. They, they they got a committee together and said, okay, let's let's change the nomenclature on the complement, and and they tried to make it uniform, and it, it has never caught on. And people refuse to go you know, to go along with it, so it's still stuck this way. And even if you look in your textbook, C2A will be the larger binding component. All the others are the B component that binds. Okay, can't help it. We, it was tried and it didn't work, but it's, it, there's only one exception. All right. In the complement system, there are actually a number of different pathways. The first pathway of complement activation is referred to as the classical pathway simply because it was the first pathway that was actually described. The, there are uh, two other pathways, the lectin pathway and an alternative pathway. Obviously, as the name implies, this is going to involve some sort of lectins. This is what's called the alternative pathway. This was actually the second pathway discovered. This was first, it was called the classical pathway. This became the second pathway, so this was the alternative pathway. And then they found the third pathway, the lectin pathway. All right. Now, this... The classical pathway is antibody dependent. So in order to get activation through this pathway, you require antibody. Now again, there are a couple exceptions to that rule, but, but by and large, this is the antibody dependent pathway. So this is one way that there's going to be interaction between those, the, the specific and nonspecific system, uh, because antibody is required for this pathway. The other two pathways are independent of antigen. And this is important because, obviously, if we only had this pathway, we would have to have the, the specific immune or the adaptive immune system to be, uh, to, to be stimulated before complement would have its activity. And you wouldn't be, uh, if, you, if you, this is the first time you come across a pathogen, you wouldn't have any antibody there. So these pathways are really important because these are really acting as the primary pathway of complement activation after the first exposure to an, to an organism. After we've been exposed, then this pathway can take effect. Okay? All three of these pathways then converge when they reach the, the, the production, the activation of C3 and the generation of a C5 convertase. That's when these pathways end. So all of these pathways are going to come down to a point where they activate C3 and they create a C5 convertase. All right, and they, they converge at that point. Once you, they go through, once they've converged at this point, then there is a common pathway that is referred to as the lytic pathway. C5 gets activated, and then you go under the lytic pathway. So we have three separate pathways to get to this point, and then they converge, and then there's one common lytic pathway. And we'll talk about each of these pathways, how they work. All right, so we'll start with the classical pathway. The, the first one that was actually described. These are the protein components of the classical pathway. C1, QRS, C2, C3, and C4. All right? Remember, this was, a, this was a pathway that is dependent upon antibody, so we have to have antibody there. So here's our bacterial surface. We're getting infected with, with some sort of pathogen. 
And we have antibody against that. The antibody binds to the bacterial cell. All right? And the first thing that occurs, once we have an immune complex, an antigen-antibody complex, C1-QRS can bind. So C1-QRS binds to the antibody molecule. This is a, the, the, the formation of this complex is calcium-dependent. That's why I have calcium in here. And um, that's not unimportant. It has some practical uh, value in the sense that you have to be aware of the fact, if, you want to, if you're going to try to get complement levels on a patient of yours, you want to make sure that, that you tell the, the techs that are drawing the blood that you wanted this to be done for complement. Because if they take a purple top tube, which has got EDTA in there as an anticoagulant, what's going to happen? You're going to chelate all the calcium ions. And complement activity is going to be destroyed by, by chelating the calcium. It's completely dependent upon calcium. So it's important when you're ordering these things that you tell them you, know, you want complement levels, and they'll pull the right tubes then when you tell them what you want. But if you pull the wrong tube, you won't get any activity. All right. So this is calcium dependent, and we get the first first thing that binds is C1 QRS. The binding of C1 QRS to the antibody molecule then results in the activation of a proteolytic a prote protease in C1R that actually cleaves C1S. So C1R chip cleaves off a piece of C1S. Once that has happened. This is now called activated C1, C1 QRS. And so you would now, you, if you see this in writing, this would be with an overline here. So this is now an activated C1 QRS. All right. The activated C1 QRS then next uses C4 as its substrate, and it cleaves C4 into two pieces, C4B and C4A. The larger binding component binds to the activation complex. The smaller component is released into the microenvironment. So we have C4B now binding, binding to the activation complex. Now, this C4B is you depicted it here, binding to the bacterial cell, and that can certainly happen. But what can also happen, the C4B can actually bind to the, uh, the antibody molecule as well. So it could be binding here or here but it's binding in the vicinity of the bacteria, okay? <laughs> so it will be depicted as it binding to the bacteria. So now we have C4B, little b, binding to the bacteria. This enzyme up here, this activated C1, also uses C2 as a substrate, and this also cleaves C2 into two components, the larger one, C2A, and the smaller one, C2B, the larger component associates with the C4B to form this complex. The C2B, the smaller component, is released into the microenvironment. All right, so now we have this complex form. This is a C3 convertase. So C4, little b, 2, little a, is a C3 convertase. And it will now act on C3. And so this convertase acts on C3, and it cleaves C3 into two pieces. C3B, which remains associated with the, the activation complex, and C3A, which is released into the supernatant. Okay? This complex here, C4B, C2A, C3B, is a C5 convertase. And that is the end of the, the classical pathway. We've, converted, we've made our C5 convertase, all right? And so this pathways ends, all right? So we simply went through a series of steps, each one reacting with the next one, forming complexes, which then worked on the next component, all right? Now, <laughs> these, these, let me go, just go back here. These components, a lot of these components that are really like the C4A, C2A, the C3A, C2B, these components have biological activities that can be protective. C2B, this component, this is the component, the, the exception again, the, the, the B component that's released. This is a prokinin, and it is cleaved by kinin. Uh, by plasmin to yield kinin. And what do kinins do? 
they cause edema. All right? So you get edema. And that's why you see in, in inflammation there's edema, because of the production of C2B, this, which can be converted to the kinin by plasma. Right? The C3A that's released, this is an, an anaphylatoxin. It will bind and activate basophils and mast cells and to cause them to degranulate, releasing all the, gr the granules in, in the basophils and mast cells. And what do those granules do? They increase vascular permeability. They lead to constrict, contraction of smooth muscle cells. Un if, if, if there's too much activation, so you have a, so a lot of C3B, that can result in anaphylaxis. The C3B that is produced, it is an opsonid. Macrophages and, and, and phagocytic cells, PMNs, have receptors on their surface for the, for the C3B component of, of complement. And so it acts as an opsonin. So this will, and will opsonize the bacterial cell. In addition, C3B activates those phagocytic cells so that they, be, they carry out their functions better. So we're allowing the cell now to be phagocytose and, to, and activating the phagocytic cells so that they can, ki can kill those the bacteria better. The C4A that's released is also an anaphylatoxin. It is less potent than C3A, but it, is, it does have anaphylactic activity as well. It does the same things as C3A. C4B, that's part of the, the activation complex, that's an opsonin for phagocytic cells. Phagocytic cells have a receptor for C4B as well. So this acts as an opsonin. So these components then are, are con contributing to the ability of phagocytic cells to become act activated and to phagocytize the, the, the particles that, that these complexes are forming on. Now, these components, this pathway's got to be regulated because if you don't regulate it, you're going to end up with anaphylaxis at least. If you get too much C3, C3A and C4A being produced, you're going to end up with anaphylaxis. So there are ways to regulate this process as well. And one of the regulators is this C1 inhibitor, or C1 INH. What this protein does is it binds to the activated C1 and causing the dissociation of C1R and C1S from, the, from C1Q. So you break apart the complex. You break apart the complex. You cannot activate any of the other components. The, the, the thing stopped. So this, all, this is a major activator of that whole pathway because this is the first step, right? C1QRS is the first step in the, in the activation of complement. You knock out the ability of C1Q to do its job. You wipe out everything. So this, this is a major regulator of the entire pathway. C3A was this anaphylatoxin, so there's got to be a way of, 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 of regulating this thing, and there is a C3A inactivator, or C3INA. This is actually, the other name for this, this is a carboxypeptidase. This is carboxypeptidase B, is, is, is the C3 inactivator. And it inactivates C3A, so that you don't end up in it with anaphylaxis when we get an activation of the complement system. C3B. There are a number of factors that regulate this. Factor H and factor I. Factor I is actually the enzyme that degrades factor B. But factor H facilitates the activity of, of factor I. So they, they work together. Factor, a, factor I is the actual one that cleaves, fact, de degrades C3B. Factor H just facilitates the activity of, of factor I. C4A. The same inactivator, carboxypeptidase B, actually activates C3A and C4A. So it acts on both of those. The C4B component has a regulator. There's a protein called C4 binding protein. It binds to C4, and it does a number of different things. It allows factor I now to also destroy C4B. So together with factor I, this is analogous to the factor H. It, it helps factor I degrade C4B. But in addition, the binding for C4 binding protein also prevents the association of C2 with the C4B, all right? Thus, you block the formation of the C3 convertase. So the, the, this, this plays an important role in regulating this pathway. This is an example of what happens if you don't regulate a pathway. There are patients that have deficiencies in C1, the C1 INH, the inhibitor of C1. Remember, this is the major controller over that pathway. 
what happens any time these patients get any sort of uh, infection or, or trauma to, to tissues where complement gets activated by this pathway, they end up with this, what is referred to as hereditary angioedema. You get this huge amount of edema. Here's the area in this person's lip. Why is that happening? Why do you think that's happening? Too much of the kinin, because you, you, this is unregulated production. You get too much of that C2A uh, being produced. Uh, uh, s, s, yeah, s, okay, see, I get confused. It's, it's the C2B, uh, the, the one that's the, uh, the exception to the rule. So too, too much C2B is being released, get converted into kinin, you get edema. Why do you think the, these patients don't go into anaphylaxis, however? They just get this localized edema. Why do you think they don't go into anaphylaxis? If you don't, if you're not regulating this, the the you don't have any C1 inhibitor there. You got all those other regulatory things that regulate C3 and C4, C3A and C4A. So you don't, you you know, even though you you're not regulating the whole pathway by this C1 at, at C1, you still can inactivate the C3A. So these patients don't go into anaphylaxis, but they get these localized edema. All right, that's the classical pathway. The next pathway is the lectin pathway. And here's the components of the lectin pathway. We have a bacterium that has to have mannose on its surface. We have the mannose binding lectin protein. We have these MASP1 and MASP2. These are the mannose binding lectin associated serum proteases, and MASP1 and MASP2. And then we have C2 and C4. All right. So how does this pathway work? Here's our bacterium that has mannose on its surface. And many bacteria, in fact, probably most bacteria, have mannose on their surfaces. All right, so what happens? The mannose binding lectin recognizes the mannose, and it binds to the mannose residues on the bacterium. The binding of the mannose binding lectin to the bacterium a engagement of the, the, the lectin with its ligand allows MASP1 and MASP2 to associate with the mannose binding lectin. This results in activation. In the activation, what happens is MASP1 acts as an enzyme to clip off a piece of MASP2. And now we have an activated component. This is analogous to C1QRS, basically what's happening. This, this is an analog of C1QRS. So what happens, once this has been activated, it reacts with C4 and cleaves C4 into two subcomponents, C4B and C4A. The B component, the larger one, binds to the activation membrane. The smaller component is released into the microenvironment. This also acts on C2. This activated component acts on C2 to clip it into C2A and C2B. C2A associates with C4B. C2B is released into the supernatant. Right? What's this? That's C3 convertase. So this is the C3 convertase. It'll convert, it'll act on C3 to create it, cleave it into C23A and C3B, which generates the C5 convertase, and that's the end of this pathway. So this pathway is analogous to the classical pathway. The only difference is, is that we don't use C1QRS. We use mannose binding lectin and, lectin and MASP1 and MASP2. This is the analog of, of, of C1QRS. The pathway is identical otherwise. Yes? With C2 and C4 binds, does it matter the order of It does matter the order. C4 goes first. So the order is always, complementologists don't know how to count. They can't count one, two, three. They count one, four, two. So yes, it does matter. The order is, is important. All right? So this pathway is basically identical to the classical pathway. It's regulated in, in the, the same way. You can you regulate these, these various components and so on. So that's, that's it for the, the lectin pathway. The lectin pathway is actually simple if you understand the, the classical pathway. Now the hard pathway, the alternative pathway. All right, here's the components of the alternative pathway. It, C3, factor B, factor P or preparatin, and factor D. 
All right, so how does this pathway activate? Now, I guess let me just say one thing else about the, the lectin pathway. Again, keep in mind that, that that pathway is really important because it doesn't depend on antibody. So the first time we're exposed to a bacteria, that pathway it can be very important in, in protecting, all right, because there's no antibody present. And it's the same thing going to be true of this one. This, is, remember, is not dependent upon antibody. And so this is one of the first lines of defense when we get first get exposed to, to an organism. So here are our components. So how does this pathway work? It starts with C3. Now, C3 has, this is a protein, but it has, there's a, there's a particular bond in the molecule that is, is highly susceptible to hydrolysis. And even spontaneously, as we're sitting here, our C3 and our serum, there's a very, very low rate of hydrolysis of C3. And so C3 gets hydro hydrolyzed. Spont this is occurring spontaneously into an altered form called C3i. All right? Now, this C3i now is going to lead ultimately to the generation of a C3 convertase, a, a bona fide C3 convertase. So how does it do that? C3i binds factor B. The binding of factor B to C3i makes C, this factor B susceptible to degradation or digestion by factor D. So factor D comes in and then clips off a piece of factor B. And so we end up with factor B, little b, all right? This complex then now will, this, this complex is really fairly unstable and it's broken down rather, rather rapidly, but there is a finite half-life for this thing. And if there is some C3 around while it's still alive, this, C, this factor will now make will cleave C3 into C3b and C3a. So again, so this is happening spontaneously. We get this spontaneous hydrolysis, allows factor B to bind, which begin, then becomes susceptible to, to uh, uh, activation by factor D. W then this thing will activate some C3 and form bona fide C3b, okay, and some C3a. Now, once we have this generated, once, once C3b is there, now this, and this is true C3b, this is not C3i. This then binds some factor B, which makes it susceptible to factor D. It cleaves it. And this can get more C3 and digest it. And really, you get some C3 produced. That C3 can bind factor B, digest to factor D, now, if more C3 comes in, it's broken down. That C3B is released. That finds, binds factor B, acceptable to factor D. It gets cleaved. C3 is cleaved again. And you see, what you get is a loop that keeps going on and on and on and on and on. And you, you start making a lot of these, these, these components. You start making a lot of C3A. You start making a lot of C3B. Okay. And so this, this thing will just continue on and on and on. And it all started with this, this spontaneous hydrolysis of C3 into this C3i. And this is just going to keep going on. So what's going to happen if this keeps going on? You're going to run out of C3, right? You're essentially going to use up all your C3. So we're going to have to control this in some way. Okay? So how is it controlled? All right, remember C3b, C C3, little b, that has, has combined to membranes. Well, if this is occurring no, all normally in our serum, this C3, this, some of that C3b that's being produced is going to try to, is going to try binding to our cell membranes, either erythrocytes or any, of the, any, any membrane it comes across. If it binds there, What's ultimately, we haven't hit the lytica pathway, but once we start down this pathway on, on the surface of a membrane, that can ultimately release in lysis of the membrane. So if these things were binding to our erythrocytes, if that C, spontaneously generated C3 binds to our erythrocytes, we're going to end up with anemia because we're going to lyse all our erythrocytes ultimately. So we've got to control this in some way. 
The way it's controlled is by DAF. Our cells, when, it, when, when that C3B encounters one of our cell membranes, we have on our cell membranes this protein called DAF. It's associated also with one of the complement receptors, CR1. So this C3B binds to this complement receptor, CR1, and it is now associated right with DAF. And the function of DAF is to act as a brick wall to block the association of B, factor B, with the complex. All right? So we prevent factor B from binding to C3B. Therefore, we block the activation. of, of and This is no longer susceptible to factor D. In addition, the fact that the DAF is also another ability. If you've already got some complex form, it can dissociate this complex. So we can break down this complex, all right? Thereby interrupting the, that loop. Otherwise, the, if this loop goes on, it's going to keep going on and we're going to use all our C3. This is going to block that. And, it, and it's going to also going to block, if it, when it binds our membranes, we're not going to lyse our own cells. So we're going to regulate this by a pathway. All right, so here's the two ways that it can block. You can block here. In addition, this is an addition. Once this C3B is now here sitting in the complement receptor, it now becomes more susceptible to, to breakdown or degradation by factor I. So factor I comes in and destroys factor C3B, this C3B. So you see what we're doing is we're getting rid of all these components that are spontaneously being generated. In addition, factor H is important because factor H comes in here and dissociates factor B and makes this C3B even more susceptible to factor I. So what we've done is we've, we've generated some of this spontaneously generated C3B because of this endogenous, this hydrolysis of some of our C3B. We let this go on, but we destroy all the components in the process. So we don't, it doesn't keep going on and on and on and on and on. And so this is happening all the time. So what does this have to do then with, uh, and this just goes on to show that this C3I, I, that once, C3B, once C3B is broken down by factor I, it is even more highly susceptible to factor I, and factor I breaks it down into lots of small pieces, all right? So what happens is, all right, let, me, let me go back. So what does it all have to do with protection? How does this protect us? I mean, we're saying that this is happening spontaneously in, in our serum. As we're sitting here today, that's, it's going on. So what has it got to do with protection? And, and what role does this all play? Well, what happens is when the C3B that's generated by this spontaneous process that we just talked about, when it encounters a membrane that doesn't have any protector like DAF on it, so when it, it, when it associates with what is referred to as an activator or a protector membrane, it associates with that membrane. But there's no DAF or anything there to control this, to, to inactivate it in any way. So it's not inactivated. So what happens on this, on this kind of a surface, when the C3B binds, it'll bind factor B, become susceptible to factor D, and we'll get prepared in now, comes in, and stabilizes this complex. All right? So now we've got this stabilized. This will now act on C3, uh, some additional C3, breaking it into C3B and C3A. And now we have this complex, C3 little b, big B little b, C3 little b that is C5 convertase. So this is the C5 convertase of the alternative pathway. So what has happened is that when we have this thing going on in our systems all the time, this, this breakdown of, of C3, this spontaneous breakdown of C3 to C3I, and that, that ultimately leads to the generation of some bona fide C3B. We protect ourselves because if it interacts with our membranes, we've got DAF there that makes that, that dissociates it. We have factor I there that breaks it down. But when we get an infection with a bacterium, and this C3B that's generated by this spontaneous process binds to a protected or an activator membrane, 
it's not degraded. It's not protected in any way. So it goes on, and, and, and factor P actually facilitates this by stabilizing this whole thing. You get this for the generation of this complex, which is the C5 convertase. We end the pathway. Now we can go down the lytic pathway. So when it hits an activator surface, the, the thing doesn't get protected and goes on. So just to compare, when this C3B that comes through this pathway, when it hits an autologous surface, it's going to be inactivated because of DAF, because of factor I, and so on. But when it hits an activator surface, it's protected, and we result in the formation of the C5 convertase. All right, so we've now hit the end of the pathways. In the, in the two pathways, in the classical pathway and the lectin pathway, the C5 convertase is C4, little b, C2, little a, C3, little b. In the, C, in the alternative pathway, the C5 convertase is C3b, bb, C3b. Okay? So now we've got these, we've generated the convertase. That's the end of these, these various pathways. Then all of these pathways converge into the lytic pathway. All right, so the generation of the C5 convertase now feeds into the lytic pathway. And the lytic pathway is actually fairly simple. Here's the components, C5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. And in, it's amazing, they actually learned how to count by this time, and they actually go in this order, C5, 6, 7, 8, and 9. Okay? So what happens? Here's, here's the C5 convertase. Which is this? Is it the classical pathway or the, the alternative pathway? Classical pathway, okay. Uh, how do you know? If there's C4 there, it's classical pathways, or lectin pathway. I mean, it could be lectin pathway as well, but it's not alternative, okay. So here's a C5 convertase. So what does the C5 convertase do? It acts on C5, and it clips C5 into C5B and C5A. All right. Now, this actually can occur. The C5 doesn't immediately bind to the, the membrane. You know, ultimately, it's going to bind, but it doesn't bind to immediately. It associates with C6 and C7 to form what is referred to as the membrane attack complex, or MAC, M-A-C, membrane attack complex, because this now binds to membranes. And obviously, this, all this is occurring in the vicinity of the bacterium where this all is, you know, where the C5 convertase is being generated. So the, the first membrane that's going to come across is, is the bacterial membrane, so it binds to the bacteria. And we have the, the MAC complex binding to the bacteria. That results in the association of C8 with the complex, and after C8, C9. And it's multiple copies of C9. And what happens, C9 actually assembles in, in association with this complex and forms a pore in the membrane. It actually is a transmembrane protein that forms a pore in the membrane. And once we have a hole in the membrane, all the contents of the cell are going to leak out these cells, the cell lysis. And so we end up lysis. Here's, here's the actual uh, EM of, of, of an erythrocyte. And you can see this is the C9 complex forming, the, poking this hole in the, in the membrane of the cell, ultimately the cell lysis. So we kill the cell. All right. Now, components of the, there are the there, there's a major component of the, the, besides the lytic part of it, but the C5A is also released in this pathway. And this C5A plays a very, very important role in the complement system because C5A actually has a lot of functions. C5A activates neutrophils, so it's a neutrophil activator. It stimulates, it's, it's one of these SOS signals that, that causes adhesion of the neutrophils to the endothelial cells and diapedesis. C5A is also a chemotactic factor. So when, when C5A is produced, when the, when the neutrophil, uh, or, the, or, the, for this, or for macrophage for that matter, gets into the tissue spaces, <coughs> it will chemotax towards the, the uh, gradient of C5A. And so you'll get movement of the neutrophil towards the source of the, the uh, C5A. So it's, it's the chemotactic factor. It's a monocyte or, or man macrophage activator. It also is a mast cell and basophil degranulator. It, so it causes mast cell and basophil degranulation, <coughs> resulting in, in anaphylaxis. In fact, this is the most potent of the anaphylatoxin produced in the, in the complement system. 
C5A is the most potent, then C3A, then C4A. But they all have anaphylactic activity. So this can result in anaphylaxis, all right? C5A production. So C5 plays a real important role in this system. All right, what I've done here is I've made some tables up that sort of summarize some of the biological activities and how these things are regulated. Some of this is we've already seen. C2B, this component causes edema. It's regulated by C1AINH. C3 is an anaphylatoxin, all right? It causes anaphylaxis. It's regulated by C3INA. These are, these are review things. C3B, opsonin, regulated by factors H and I. Factor I destroys C3B. Factor H facilitates that destruction. C4A, anaphylatoxin, less potent than C3. It's inactivated by the same inactivator. C4B, we said, was an opsonin. Uh, it's, it's regulated by C4B and factor I. It's binding of C4B to factor uh, C4B makes it susceptible to factor I. C5A is the major one. Chemo, it is the only chemotactic factor in this system. In addition, it is an, an, an aflatoxin and more, more potent than C3 or C4. It is actually inactivated by the same inactivator, the carboxypeptidase. Now, this one we haven't talked about. This is C5. This, this is the MAC complex, C5, B6, and C6 and C7, that MAC membrane attack complex. This attaches to membranes. And remember, remember I said that is actually produced in the fluid phase, and then it binds to membranes. So this complex is produced in the fluid phase and then has to bind to a membrane. Obviously, if, if we have a lot of production of this material, if it's, it may start binding to our own membranes. And once it binds to our membrane, and if it, say it binds to an erythrocyte, it's going to result in the lysis of that erythrocyte because C8 and C9 are going to associate with it. You're going to lyse your own cells. So there's got to be a way of regulating this, and that's what protein S does. Protein S uh, inactivates the MAC complex. All right? And so if this is, if this is present in the, in the fluid phase, very rapidly it's broken down. Once it binds, it's stabilized. So if it binds to, a, say, a bacterial cell, if the MAC complex binds to a bacterial cell, then it won't be inactivated by protein S. Protein S is just there to protect it in the fluid phase. While it's in the fluid phase, we, we get rid of it fairly quickly so that it doesn't inadvertently bind to our own membranes. All right, let's stop here, and I'll just pick up the last bit of this. On, I will, we'll start with this.